Yeah. Yes, we're live. <laughs> Hello. Hello, guys. Hello to everyone. Uh, this is the 14th Angular Athens meetup. This is the 14th Angular Athens meetup. Σε αυτό το meetup, επειδή έχουμε καλεσμένο το εξωτερικό, θα το κάνουμε στα αγγλικά. Οκ, so, bye from me and Stefanos. Maybe you will see us afterwards and we will leave Yanis to do the introductions. Bye. Bye. So, a small introduction. Uh, for Angular Athens. Uh, welcome to our meetup, of course. And um, just a few words about who we are. Um, we are the community um, of Angular in Athens, uh, hence the name Angular Athens. Our goal, our main goal is to exchange knowledge about Angular and, of course, collaborate and help each other. Uh, also, our goal is networking, meeting people who have the same passion about uh, web uh, development, and Angular in particular. You can uh, join us in uh, the meetup.com and from the meetup.com, you can find the link where you can join our Slack, where you can ask any question about Angular and uh, I will be there to, to answer. And also you can be there to answer other people's question. This is all, uh, this is what community is all about. Also, you can find us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Angular Athens, um, even uh, Instagram, Angular Athens. And every Thursday at um, 6 um, afternoon, uh, Greece time, we hang out at uh, this Google, uh, uh, Google Meet. Uh, this link is also available in Slack, so you don't need to note it down. You can just join the Slack and then Click the link. So we will uh, every Thursday we have just a, an open talk. Everything about uh, work, Angular, web development, whatever crosses your mind is very welcome there. And if you yourself have something cool to share, a presentation you want to make, um, maybe a workshop you want uh, to uh, organize, something to give back to the community, a lighting talk, anything, uh, we have uh, this form where you can submit uh, your idea and we'll get back to you. We're very excited to introduce new people to our community. That's all for now. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so let's move on now to the first pitch. Uh, our first speaker is Mark Whitfield. Uh, he's the core team lead of NGXS and He'll talk to us about NGXS. Hi, everybody. Hello, it's Mark. And Hi. Good afternoon. Slash morning. Yeah, it's afternoon there as well. Yeah. Happy to have you. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I guess all of you are wondering about my strange accent. So I'm from South Africa. So the same time zone as you, I think. Um, but it's summer here. Uh, you wouldn't believe it because I'm wearing this this, um, this warm jacket. Uh, we just had a cold spell. And um, I must say this is very strange um, being used to speaking on um, speaking at meetups and at conferences and I can't see any of you. Um, I can't hear your jeers or laughter or anything, which is very strange. And um, about 15 minutes ago, I was putting my, my three-year-old to bed. So this is just a very strange experience, but um, I really, I'm really enjoying being here, and uh, I thank you for for giving me this opportunity to to share some of some interesting stuff with you that at least I think is interesting. Um, Katarina, could you please prompt the slides? Great. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be speaking about optimizing NGXS. Um, I've titled it Simple State and Smart Selectors, and you'll see, see why I've, I've entitled it that. Um, but these principles can be applied to, to any of the other state management libraries that there are for Angular, and also just state management in general. Um, many of these principles can apply across. So if you're using NGRX or one of the other ones, 
that um, hopefully you can you can take something out of this. Um, okay, so so who am I? Uh, a little bit about myself. So I've been developing software since um, 2002 um, professionally, but I actually started in in 1996, um, which was before JavaScript. So um, I do have to dust out the cobwebs every now and then because um, I'm quite uh, quite quite old. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm passionate about open source software. Um, <clears throat> As a result, I got involved with NGXS really in the in the early early days, the first month or two, and soon after that, I became the NGXS core team lead. Um, I am I'm an advocate for quality software development practices. Um, so, speaking about design patterns and um, clean architecture, clean code, um, all of that sort of stuff. That's um, I'm really passionate about that. Um, probably my biggest thing on that front is is um, is I'm a fan of test driven development or TDD, um, and really any other human centered development methodologies that that make it easier for developers to to think about and write software. Um, so before before I get into the talk, I want to start with this premise. So the most valuable developers write simple code testable code, maintainable code, and human code. To me, these factors are what set a, a just an average developer apart from one that is really valuable. Do they, do they write for themselves or do they write for the team? Do they write thinking about how this code is going to be maintained into the future? Um, do they put something in place to, to ensure that the requirement that, that, that they're fulfilling right now is going to be able to last the test of time? Uh, do they take responsibility for the feature that they're implementing past the next developer touching it, um, i.e. unit tests, automated tests, those sort of things around them? Um, these are the things that I believe make a developer valuable um, to a company. Um, OK, so I've spoken about NGXS. So far, it's this might be this four-letter acronym for you, and you might wonder what these, these different letters mean. Um, but basically, the NG is anything Angular, starts with NG, because we know that. Um, the X is in place of a version number, because many of the early, early libraries were NG2 something, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as the version numbers increased, um, people started to put an X there. So the only thing that really stands for something here is the S at the end, and it's very simply state. So it's state management for Angular. Um, some of the goals of, of writing NGXS were really looking at um, creating something that was simple to use, reducing boilerplate, and taking more of an Angular approach. So let's have a look at what, what, um, what NGXS state management is, is about before we get into the heart of this talk. So it's your typical state management pattern where we have actions and selectors, and we leverage these in order to communicate between our state and our components. But now what is state? Every, every application that we write deals with data. Some of that data is coming from a server. Some of that data is being filled in by the user on some sort of forms. Some of the data is uh, persistent. It lasts a long time. Some of it is quite uh, temporal. Some, some of it is quite um, transient. It lasts just a short amount of time. And as we write our applications and as our applications grow, we need to devise some sort of strategy in terms of how we deal with the data in our application. The, the sort of strategies that we need to eventually come up with are how do we take what is captured and get it to the back end? How do we cache things that we don't want to continually query the back end for? How do we combine data that came from different sources into, into a unified view of that data that makes sense to the user? I don't think any of us are, are pushing out our JSON responses or or any other sort of responses straight at the user, we change the data in some sort of sort of way. And 
these strategies are very important to decide in your application because they will decide the maintainability and the longevity of the application. So NGXS is state management written specifically for Angular. Some of the other state management approaches, it feels like you're in a little bit of a different paradigm. Um, there's a lot of RxJS or functional concepts, and, and many of those things are quite difficult for an Angular developer to, to get on board with. So NGXS leverages decorators, classes, um, dependency injection, all of, all of which are very familiar to your typical Angular developer. And also the other thing is that um, the, the one thing that I really like about it is that it provides a place for your application's intelligence to live. Um, so as I said, I've got a few cobwebs. I've been around quite, quite a long time. In the beginning of my career, I was writing on the Microsoft stack and I was writing Windows Forms. And these Windows Forms applications, um, many of them that we dealt with had these problems where the developers would pile all of their code in behind the form. Uh, behind a button click, there would be a SQL query that accessed the database. And these applications would just become these, these behemoths that were difficult to control and to maintain. And Windows Forms is very much um, in the far distant past. But um, as we write our single page applications, our Angular applications, or React, or whatever else um, is your flavor, um, I've seen many of those same bad habits coming into, um, into developers' applications, where components are becoming those places, those God classes, where, where the code is just, it's just dumped in there because, hey, I don't know where else to, where else to put it. Um, sometimes people start to refactor and create some sort of service. But um, I open up a component, and I see a lot of code. And that's often untestable code. It's sort of very difficult to test. And it's, it's um, quite a bit to get, to get around. And the other thing about NGXS is that it follows the CQRS pattern. So CQRS stands for the Command Query Responsibility Segregation Pattern. Um, you can read up about that. I won't go into talk about that today. Um, but essentially, um, you're separating um, what you're asking your application to do from what you asking um, or querying information from it. Essentially, you're decoupling your reads from your writes in your application. And these that, that simple paradigm can allow an application to scale really well. OK, so. Let's get into NGXS and have a look at the components of NGXS as an introduction. So firstly, we have actions. So as you can see with that code sample there, the, that's, it's just a plain old class. It's called load recipes. Uh, there's a static type on it, which gives it a, a user-friendly name. Um, and then in its constructor, we pass in some, some data that are going to become part of this um, this uh, payload, we can imagine that this is an envelope of sorts that's going to carry some information around our application. So that action represents a message or an event or a command uh, within your application. Um, some people advocate for leading, leaning more towards, uh, towards events than commands. But really, this is, it's just a message in your application. Um, the other thing is that it reveals intent. This is this is our want to what I want to happen, or this has just happened, and and it's broadcasting this message throughout our application. Um, the other thing about um, using classes here is that we have a type safe payload, um, because we are using classes and not just plain old ob object literals. Um, we get we get type safety knowing that in this case recipe type is of type string, or which other whichever other pieces of data we put on this object um, are all type safe. The other thing is that actions are multicast, and they have a life, life cycle. So um, I'll get into the life cycle in a little bit. But multicast, essentially, I can have many parts of my application responding to the same message. For example, if my message is log out because the user is logging out, 
there might be different parts of my application state that need to clear out or reset or, or set back to defaults or something like that um, just to clean themselves up as part of the logout process. So multiple places in my application can receive that same message and respond to it. So there's no coupling between the sending of the message and who's going to uh, consume that message. And then lastly, um, applications, sorry, actions have a life cycle in NGXS. And this is something quite unique to NGXS. An, app, a, an action goes through the process of being dispatched, and then it gets processed, and then it's completed, which is either it's either canceled or successful completion, or there was an error. So I'll get further into that um, in, a, in a slide to come. So now let's talk about state. So our state of our application is the part of the application that is going to receive and respond to these actions. In NGXS, once again, you create a class for your state. Um, you don't have to think about reduces or any of those typical Redux things. Um, we create a class for our state. This represents this part of the state in the application. I don't need to worry about where it sits in the, in the global scheme of things. This is almost an atomic state. I could imagine that it's separate to the rest of the state in the application. Um, the mental paradigm is much simpler here. Um, it, has a, it, has a, it has a model that it represents. And then in this case, um, the model just contains items. And that's an empty array as a default. Um, so the other thing is that we can inject Angular services into our state for side effects. So in this case, we are injecting our recipes API service, um, which you'll see some code now that can leverage it in order to perform some sort of side effect. Um, so this is an example of, of a method of that class. So this is declared within that class that responds to an action. So as you can see, it's called load recipes. It's responding to the action called load recipes. Um, there's no particular tie-up between those names. We can name them as, as we like. Um, <clears throat> and it takes in, it takes in some, uh, some context, and it takes in an action. Now, something that's very interesting here is that um, so this piece of code will be executed in response to the load recipes action as it is dispatched. So what's very interesting here is you'll see that we have the async, we're using async await, which is really easy for, uh, for more junior software developers or apprentice software developers to grasp instead of having to think about observables and doing a switch map or concat map or merge map or the, the list goes on of operators. We can really write simple code here. Plus, we, in response to this, um, this action, we are do, doing some asynchronous work, and then we can continu continue to do some other work. We, as, as you would have seen in many applications that use state management, you would, uh, or your, your strict Redux pattern, you would have load recipes, load recipes complete, and load recipes failure, or success and failure. So often, we have this pair of three actions in order to represent the life cycle of this action. Um, in NGXS, this life cycle is built in. Async handlers, it's, it's a first class citizen for doing asynchronous work. Um, I could be calling one service, modifying some state, doing another service, modifying some state, calling another service. And this all happens very naturally within um, NGXS's constructs. Um, and it's got some utility functions there that on that context. So we're using patch state in order to patch the state object. Um, and we've got a whole plethora of very useful operators for uh, modifying our state that's, that's safe when it comes to immutability, because we still have to honor the immutability contract. OK. Um, yes, I went through everything there, just checking. Great. Now it comes to selectors. So obviously, our application can tell our state about all these things that are happening. But really, we need to ask some questions at some point in order to display some information. This is where selectors come in. So a selector 
it re represents a query. When we think about CQRS, command query, um, this, is, this is when we query for part of our state. So in the case of that previous state, um, in this code example, you can see recipe state dot items. So items is part of that state. So we are interested in those, those items that maybe have been loaded from an API or however they got, they got there. And this example here is the example of a, the, the declaration of a selector. Um, it's got a decorator at the top that basically tells it, well, this is the information that I would like you to pass in as a parameter into this method. So you can see our sorted item, items has a recipe argument. And if we look at the code, it sorts the recipes and then returns the recipes. Then this selector, sorted items, can be used at, at some later stage if something needs a list of sorted items or sorted recipes. So, so the, the great thing about these selectors is that um, they don't just, you can actually pull in multiple selectors into one selector. They are composable and also they are cached based, based on their arguments. This is known as memoization. So if the exact same object reference to the recipes array um, is used with the same method, that sort will not need to be done again. It will just return the, the previous result. So for example, if some other area of my state changed, um, I just liked a, friend, a friend's post or something, that doesn't change the recipes. There's no re recalculation that needs to happen in order for, uh, for me to get my, my sorted recipes. Um, and one more thing is that these, um, these are pure functions. So you can test sorted items directly, pass it in some recipes and make sure that it sorts correctly. Um, and you can write a unit test for that. Now, for the last aspect of this is our, our components. How do our components receive data from our state and how do they send out these actions? In this code sample, you'll see that there's a, a select decorator, so at select. And here we're using our sorted items selector that we declared on our recipe state. Um, so you just, just put that decorator above there, very similar to how you'd put your input or output decorators in Angular. And that recipes dollar property will be populated with that observable ready for use by your application. Um, and you'll see in the method there, select recipe, um, we need to use our store. And from our store, we go to dispatch and we give it, we instantiate a new one of those classes. We basically packaged up our message, our envelope, and we dispatch that off. And whoever's interested in our select recipe is going to be able to respond to that and do whatever they need to do. So something great about this is that we, we've got minimal RxJS complexity. Um, in our templates, we can use the async pipe. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend reading up about it. The async pipe will manage your subscriptions for you. Um, <clears throat> we've also got first class support for, um, for reactive development. So you can change your, your component for on push and get all the performance benefits um, from that. And once again, you can also see that in my comp component, I'm minimizing the amount of code behind. I'll go into a code sample a bit later that will demonstrate this principle. And lastly, plugins. What is a library without plugins? All good libraries have lots of plugins, um, harking back to jQuery days, but we're not there now. Um, NGXS has an amazing library of plugins um, from ease of interaction with Angular Forms, synchronizing that with your state, um, synchronizing your state with storage, rehydrating it when you open up your application, um, dealing with the router, or in American terms, router, um, synchronizing that with your state, um, logging to the console, working with Firebase, the Redux dev tools, and many more. We actually have a, a separate organization called NGXS Labs, where new plugins are experimented with. Um, and that's very exciting. We have a very active community around that. OK, so that was quite an introduction. Now let's, now let's get into the crux of, of this talk. So 
simple state smart selectors. This is what we're talking about today. And if I think about my application, I have some states, some data in my application, and I have a, a few different views. I'm deliberately talking about views as opposed to components. Um, now, you can think of a view as something that, um, that a user, or it's, it's almost like their worldview as they would be looking into your application. Obviously, you'd be using components to make up those views. But essentially, our application is made up of multiple views um, looking at different aspects of our state in our application, sometimes building onto that state, sometimes just representing a combination of state. So let's get into the principles that I'm wanting to speak about. So when it comes to our state, and in our case, we can think about NGXS or NGRX or whichever state management paradigm you're using, I'm advocating for storing raw data in your state, as raw as possible. So if you've captured some input, take that captured input and put that into your state. Um, if you obviously need it as part of your state management. If you take, if you have requested some state from the server, put that as it came from the server into your state and do minimal, minimal transformations in your state. Um, you don't need to manipulate those objects too much. And um, there are some cases with extremely deeply nested state that you might need to flatten it out a bit. But the general principle is, is um, don't touch the data too much. Just get it into the state in your raw form. And then the other principle is talking about selectors, our smart selectors. We would want to create, um, create selectors in order to manipulate, to transform that state, combine the state um, as our views would require. So um, in order to do this, I create what I call query classes. Many people call them selector classes. These are literally static or classes with just static members on them. They don't, they don't actually have um, any services injected to, to them or anything. And they just they have these selectors on there that are um, to do with that topic for convenience. I'll, I'll get into the code sample now so it, it'll come become clearer. Um, and then also to create view select specific selectors. So we can create these query classes that have more kind of domain concepts. So for example, let's have a sorted list of recipes because that's handy. But then some view at some point in time will need that information. So instead of pushing out our sorted, our sorted list straight into our view, um, we might need to manipulate that. So let's rather do that in a selector that uses that sorted list. And then the view can use that selector um, so we, we look to rather create view models, these, these richer models that are closer to what the view needs. Um, and we don't need to do too much manipulation in our um, components. OK, so I'm going to get into an example now, and, and we can go through some code. Um, so it's the NGXS Diner. So we have a restaurant and it receives some orders for tables. We have a kitchen that prepares these order, orders for the patrons. And we have a stock room that supplies the ingredients to the kitchen to fulfill those orders. OK, so I've been talking quite a bit, but let's get to some code. I think this is, um, this is the fun part that we're all waiting for. So let's make sure that I can do this, do this well. OK, you can see my code. Hopefully, that is big enough. I can't really make it bigger on my screen. Otherwise, I won't be able to see what I'm doing. Now, um, <clears throat> OK, so this is the NGXS Diner um, repository. It is available on GitHub at this at Mark Whitfeld slash NGXS Diner. And of course, because it's on GitHub, easy to get it into StackBlitz. So you can have a look yourself. So let's have a look at the application. Um, so I threw this together in four hours. So it was, forgive the design sins here, but um, I'm using material. So we have our, re our restaurant with uh, multiple tables, 
And so we've got eight tables here. So let me open up this table for ordering. And let's order a few things. So I'll have a curried beef stew. And um, I'm not quite sure what that is. I suspect that some of you might know. Um, but it sounds good. So I have it um, flathead pizza, yes. And let's have another curried beef stew. Um, I'll get rid of the pizza. There we go. OK, so we have our orders for this table. And I'll go through and place some orders for some other some other tables. OK. So our restaurant is buzzing, and this is all fantastic. Now the, the kitchen wants to have a look at what's come through, what people have ordered, what they need to prepare. So here we have our production schedule, and they can see the two curried beef stew and the different quantities of these different exotic meals that I can't pronounce because this is a fancy restaurant. Um, and then let's have a look at the, the stock room. So this is a summary of the required stock for these specific recipes that needs to be pulled off the shelf. So this stock here, um, it's a total of 500 grams ground meat that's potentially used in multiple dishes. So these are the combinations of all of those all of those different ingredients that need to be pulled out of the cupboard. Um, and we've even got some uh, some nan ingredients because um, that's good to good to get some ingredients from our nana. Oof. I can't hear anyone laughing. It's that bad. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so let's get onto the code for this very simple application. Um, <clears throat> okay. So if I have a look at my restaurant. I have some state here. I have my orders state. And as you can see, I'm using these actions to open table, close table, I'm adding a choice for a table that's choosing an item off the menu or removing a choice. Um, so my state is, is pretty simple and straightforward. And we have some other state here, which is our tables. So here's, here you can recognize these sorted items. And um, we've got load tables. And this goes, goes off to the API and fetches our list of tables because um, we might have COVID and have to halve our number of tables very quickly. Um, so those are two pieces of state that's there. And um, I'll just go up here. And here you can see this is my recipe state. This is also loaded from, from an API. And these recipes have all the ingredients and everything. So these are the components of the state of my application. And <clears throat> you can see that here I've created some smart selectors in order to, uh, to query this information. So I want to get all the ordered items um, as a map with a count of each of those items. So you can imagine that this is being used by my, by my restaurant in the kitchen, knowing how many are, are ordered. Uh, so these are these smart selectors that I'm talking about. Now let's have a look at my components because um, components often have, let me go here. So this component, code behind, really is, okay, I'm just getting some state there. Um, let's go to my page, my restaurant home page. Oh, there's, there's not much code there either. That's also using a selector. And here's the, um, the async pipe that I was talking about. And there I passed my table orders from my view model. And <clears throat> if I have a look through here, this is probably my most complex one. This is the actual table view where you can do your ordering. And I have some state that's coming in. And very simply, I've, I've got add choice and remove choice, and that's just two different actions that are dispatched. Fire and forget. I don't know who's going to receive that, but in the background, I have I have an order state that's going to receive that. Um, so let's, let's have a look at a few other parts of this application. <clears throat> so that's our restaurant. Um, so let's have a look at our kitchen. So our kitchen has a, a kitchen home page, um, which essentially has has this uh, this model with a with a 
with the count of each of those res each of those meals that has been ordered and the and the and the meal. So I leverage another general purpose selector and I modify transform that data into the shape that makes sense as a view model um, for my kitchen. Um, so that's if we have a look at the code in the kitchen, code in the query, very simple code. Um, the views are very, very um, anemic. They have very little, little code behind them. They are very simple, very straightforward. Lastly, let's have a look at our stock room. So maybe there's some complexity here because those ingredients, that was a long list of ingredients. And yes, you're right. Good one there, audience member who shouted that out. Um, yes, we have some complexity here. And I mean, this is this is a large selector. Typically, I wouldn't write a large one like this, but um, this could be refactored into smaller selectors and we can take advantage of more memorization and caching on those selectors. But this essentially takes all the ordered recipes, and it pivots the data, fetches all the ingredients, sums up per quantity on the, on the ingredients, and comes out with our fantastic view for our stock room to, to pull out information. So as I said, this, this example is available on GitHub and on StackBlitz. I will include these, these links afterwards. Um, so let me go back to my slides. Hopefully I can get this right. Woohoo! There we go. Okay, so do some desktop arranging. Great. Enough code. Too much code now. I can't keep you people happy. Okay, what did we just learn? So the principles that I spoke about earlier are keeping our, our data as raw as possible in our state. So as you saw there, I was fetching from the API, putting it in the state, and that was it. Um, <clears throat> capturing the state, it came straight through as actions, went into the state, and, and that was and that was that. And then I created classes for composing my selectors. Um, I created these more kind of general purpose selectors. And then I had some um, view specific selectors, which were my, my view model queries. So as you can see, there's a bit of a model here. There's my orders and recipe state. And my ordering screen has a view on two parts of the state. My kitchen has a view onto my orders. My stock has a view onto my orders and my recipes. And then my recipe list has a view onto my recipes. I haven't implemented that view. So thank you, thank you very much. I hope that there was um, enough to to take something back into into your own um, your own context with that. Um, I will be sharing these slides and code and everything on Twitter after the talk. My Twitter handle is my full name. And you'll see it on the right there. So Mark Whitfeld, M-A-R-K, W-H-I-T-F-E-L-D. There's no field there. Everyone gets it wrong. And then there's at NGXS store on Twitter for related news and updates to NGXS. So thank you very much for having, having me. I hope you learned something today. Hello, Yanis. Would you like to? Um, I added you in the stream. <laughs> so, thank you very, very much, Mark, for this talk. It was great. I I feel like I learned a lot of things that I didn't know. <laughs> um, Yanis, would you like to to take up? Yes. Thank you as well for for the speech. Pretty pretty interesting uh, stuff. Uh, we'll give some time now to the audience to make some questions. I have a couple of questions myself, uh, if I may. Uh, one would be, uh, like, if you use custom Angular decorators to, to, to create this nice uh, at actions, at uh, stay. OK, OK, that's nice. Yeah. And another question that I had was, uh, how does N uh, how does indeed access decides to bust the the, the cast of, of your custom selectors? To to bust the 
the, the caching. You, you said that you do some caching in the custom selectors, but uh, how do you um, like uh, decide to refresh that uh, that you need to fetch uh, again the data? Okay, so so with um, with NGXS, it's a it's a global state management paradigm, just like just like Redux. So when when anything modifies the state, essentially all of those observables in your application would have the opportunity to refresh. Um, so the way that it works is um, it takes it very much takes advantage of memoization. So um, if I have um, parts of my state A, B, and C, and and I've modified state A, any selectors that derive off of state A, those selectors would need to recalculate. The selectors on B and C, essentially those observables will be told there is a new state, but it will hit the memoization and say, okay, well, I don't need to do any work, any recalculation, and those observables are um, distinct until changed. So, so okay. essentially no more values come down. So you don't have to worry about telling the selectors to update. They will update as your state gets updated. Is, is that does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that's perfect actually. So you don't rec recalculate if it is not needed. It's a, a smart way of, of handling this. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and then there was a there was a question about decorators, and this this has come come up quite a few times recently. Um, so they are not they are not custom Angular decorators. Ah, okay. I saw you nods. That's why I assume that they are, and then yeah. Yeah. So so they have nothing to do with the compiler. Um, all, all it is doing at the moment is taking an advantage of the TypeScript um, decorators that are available as part of the, the experimental decorators in TypeScript. Um, and I'm sure there's one or two questions coming out of that. But with the um, all that those decorators are is they are functions that run some code. Essentially, all we do with those decorators is we, we attach some metadata onto those functions so that um, NGXS can understand a selector, and the metadata tells NGXS where to fetch the data for the parameters on that selector for. Um, so essentially, they they are um, you could think of them as a type of aspect oriented programming, um, where it's just running some code to um, to add some metadata to a class or a function or something like that. Um, so um, I have heard people say, well. Decorators are experimental. You shouldn't be using them, and I know that Google has some rules about that. Um, but in essence, those decorators are, are code, and if custom decorators or the experimental decorators disappear, we'll have a different approach. At the moment, this is the most familiar, and this is the most uh, the, one of the simplest approaches that we can offer. Um, part of our, our one of our our main aims is to make this palatable for all developers. Um, <clears throat> I was using a, a popular state management library in a very big project a, a few years ago. Um, I felt very smart once I had understood how the whole thing worked and and um, RxJS and all the observable stuff. And um, I prepared, I prepped a few talks because I was so excited about how smart I was for understanding all that. And then, us, then we handed the system over to the developers, and senior developers were terrified of the code. Um, and for me, that was that was extremely disappointing because I should not be as a as a as an experienced developer with twenty years experience, I should not be writing code that other developers cannot understand. My main objective, and you saw in the principles in the beginning, you should be writing human code. Any human or any developer, any average normal developer should be able to understand what's um, how to how to work with my code. Um, they shouldn't need a to go through multiple courses and get a degree in order to understand my code. Um, so, if, so for me, that was one of the big reasons um, that I actually joined up with NGXS when it first started because it offered an alternative that was easy for junior. I've had apprentice developers writing their own their own um, state and selectors and everything two weeks into the job, which is crazy. Um, so anyway, so 
It's very nice. It, uh, your example was pretty easy to read. If, if this uh, this is very very true with uh, the decorators. So uh, moving on to another question uh, by Stefanos. Uh, so Stefanos asks, how do you handle local state management with NGXS? Okay, so this is a hot topic at the moment. Um, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about component state or local state. Um, ones that are aligned closely to a component, um, that local state could mean a couple of couple of different things. Um, so we have a couple of ex experiments in the pipelines around that. Um, there are some really great solutions out there at the moment. For example, um, um, NGRX component store. Um, you don't that that's not bound to NGRX. You can actually use that with NGXS. Um, RX Angular um, has some has RX state, which has some really great approaches for that. Um, the the approaches that we're wanting to to take there um, are are slightly different. They're not as focused on um, on the RX JS APIs. They're wanting to make them a lot simpler so that it almost feels closer to uh, to to MobX or, or something where you don't have to think about observables all the time. So at the moment, we don't have a solution that is public, but it is in the works. Um, so I'm glad you asked that. But there are some really great solutions out there. Um, Mark Ryan also gave a, a fantastic talk on um, reactive components and local state and that sort of stuff. So I'd advise checking that out. Uh, pretty interesting. Looking forward also to to this in the future. Uh, another question by uh, Jeffrey: uh, What could you? What would be your approach on structuring the different parts? For example, would you put the actions in a command folder and put selectors in a queries folder? Yeah. So I name my actions. The folder where I put my actions, I generally name actions. And the the folder that I put my queries into, uh, or my selectors into, I, I name I name queries. Some people call the folder selectors, which I, I've, I'm neither one way or the other. I just like the name queries because it harkens more back to CQRS. But then I guess I use actions and not commands. So um, yeah. So in terms of the structuring, uh, there's no particular or specific guidance within our docs. If you want to see our docs, I didn't mention that. It's uh, ngxs.io. Um, that's where our docs live. Um, there's no specific guidance in terms of that structure. Um, but as I said, uh, this, you can have a look at this code sample and, and formulate your own opinion about um, the structure of the application. Great, thanks. Um, another question um, is uh, by BKW, can we have access to the repo? I guess the repo is public, right? Um, yep. Yes, there we go. Yeah, we, yeah that's great. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Someone that out <laughs> and find it. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then if you put um, in front between the, the slash slash and the github.com, if you put stack blitz forward slash, it'll actually open up stack blitz with all of it ready to go. So, right, pretty nice, and also to to test right away. Uh, another question by Stefanos is, um, Mark, I I noticed that you have to subscribe ev on every store dot dispatch. Is there a better way to ha handle all of these subscriptions? You also need to unsubscribe when the component is destroyed. So, I don't think I have a single subscription. In my app, I can't. I can't remember. I don't. I don't think I do. So when you dispatch, um, oh, so that's that's one of the one of the things with NGXS that's quite different. Um, so when you call store dispatch and you dispatch an action, um, you don't have to dis you don't have to subscribe in order to for that to be dispatched. Okay, so. It will it will dispatch that action, and that's all great. Now the observable that comes back from that, that observable will complete once the processing related to that action has completed. So um, if we have an async await, um, as soon as that 
essentially that function has, has finished its, ex its asynchronous execution, that's when that observable will complete. Um, so in essence, you don't need to unsubscribe because those observables will complete for you. And, um, but I don't, you might've been looking in the docs. I'm not quite sure where you see those, saw those subscriptions. Um, I, I don't, I don't really subscribe to those dispatches, um, because I prefer to model my reactivity in a different way. Um, maybe just one other thing is that, um, <clears throat> in your actions, now I'll do lots of hand wavy coding, um, in those methods that respond to your actions, if you return a promise from there, so automatically by doing async await, you're going to return a promise. Um, that is going to affect that, that action's life cycle. So that action's completion is when that method completes. Um, if I return an observable, I don't have to subscribe to that observable. It will automatically be subscribed to. Um, but that observable will now be determining when the completion of my, um, my action is. And we, you can even nest your dispatches. So if one action dispatches a number of other actions, and I'm returning an observable that's that's a merge of those ones, then essentially this action will only complete once all those other um, subsequent or inner uh, dispatches have completed. So that's that's something that we have that nobody else has um, is the the idea of a life cycle around an action. Great. I hope that answers your question. I'll, I'll do a search for, for subscriptions now. <laughs> uh, pretty nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot for, for your answers. Uh, and also, thank you a lot for uh, being here and giving, giving this, this great speech about NGXS. Uh, looking forward myself to trying, trying out this. It seems, uh, seems very straightforward to use. Uh, like uh, when reading the code, you, you didn't need any documentation. It's like at action, and then it's the action. It seems pretty nice. So looking forward myself. Thank you a lot, uh, Mark, for being here. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for laughing at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Bye. So I'll let you introduce. I just wanted to say goodbye to Mark. <laughs> All right, so for our next speaker, we have uh, Fanny Sprodromu. Um, uh, due to, to some um, uh, electricity problems in that uh, happened due to bad weather in Athens at the moment, uh, Fanny uh, will not uh, have a webcam on, but uh, he's indeed here uh, to give us a great speech about lazy components despite the difficult circumstances. Hello, Fanis. Hello, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well. nice. So, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, yeah, as you said, currently I do not have electricity. I have a battery in my in my laptop, and it will last last at about an hour and something, something like this. And I have in my room some camping torches in order to have some light. So it's a quite fun. Uh, for so this is a. Uh, strange for me, but I think that I will enjoy it, and I hope that you will enjoy it as well. All right. Best of luck, Fanny's. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, and oh, okay. we can hear you. you can start. Excellent. Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Fanny Prodromo. Uh, I'm an Angular Tech Director and Senior Instructor in the company CodeHub. I'm a front-end lead in Architects. Uh, it's a company with a very cool staff, and the, with, we have many, many cool stuff there. But one of the coolest things that you can relate is that we use NGXS, which is very cool. And I'm authoring the book Mastering Angular Reactive Forms, and I expect to have it published soon, really soon. And I'm a co-organizer of this awesome meetup, Angular Athens meetup. And on bottom right, you can see my contact details. Uh, Prodrom F, you want to, con uh, to connect with me in Twitter. If you want to check out my blog, I have some cool articles there, blog.profanus.me, or at least they're cool for me. And uh, my LinkedIn account is Prodrom F. And something new 
So this is a, a new YouTube channel. It's a code shot with Profanis. And if you have the time to scan this uh, QR code, you will directly go in the, uh, in the YouTube channel. But if you don't have the, the time to do so, uh, I have the exact same QR code at the end of this talk, if we have the time due to the electricity problems. And yeah, actually, th this YouTube channel is all about have some videos at, at maximum 10, 12, 15 minutes maximum. And the idea is uh, to present something that you can immediately use without any theory, just uh, watch the video and implement it. So that's uh, all from, uh, from, from this card. And let's start. And this topic today is about how to lazy load components. In order to present how to lazy load the components, I will guide you how to load the component using a selector. Yeah, so I promise you that it's not going to be that boring. Uh, I know that's tedious, but it's not going to be that boring. The second one is how to load dynamically a component using a factor resolver. And last but not least, how to lazy load the component. So let's get started. In order to load the component, I have very cool template. This is uh, uh, my, my template. It's a, a lot prominent. As you can see, we have this arrow and says that render your component in the dust area. So this is the area that we're going to have our components, either those being uh, lazy loaded dynamically or using a selector. And this is how the template looks like. This is just a simple HTML, just a div with class uh, wrapper container, a paragraph element and another div with a child container with some margin top and margin bottom from Bootstrap. And inside here, we're going to have our components. Nice. So think the following, that we have this, this component with this selector, up lazy content. And we have this one, this template. This is the component of the, we have a span and lazy load component. If we use this selector here, what we expect to see is the template that we see and the lazy load component to be in color red, something like this, correct? So let's have a look. And let's start first with, with the code. Let me guide you through the code. Actually, in the app component HTML, we have a lazy wrapper. And this wrapper is this, this guy here. And inside this template, I have just one selector, no more than this, just one selector. And this selector is actually this component. Let me open this component. And as we can see, we have the selector name and the template. This is the content of the lazy load component with color red, okay? And apart from this, I have one more component. It's exactly the same with the difference that I have here, the number one. Uh, yeah, I couldn't find a better name, so I named it like lazy one. And you know that if I have to create another one, I will name it like lazy two. So anyways, so the template is like, this is the content of the lazy one load component, but now the color is, is with green. Okay, so uh, give me a sec, please. Yeah, I'm back. So we have two different components. And the idea goes like this. I have here the selector. Let's go to the browser and we can see this one. And if I switch the selector and I have it like lazy one, I have the green one. And my question in this point is the following. How about if I want to select those components with a, with a condition, with an NGF condition? So I guess that we have to have like an input here in the code. And the input could be like, uh, give me the type. And the type could be either lazy or to be lazy one. And lazy will correspond to the first component and lazy one will correspond to the second component. And of course, then we can use this type inside here and have like a condition. If the type equals lazy, present this one, sorry. Otherwise, if I have lazy one, I want to display this one, okay? The missing part here now is that we have to inject in this component the type. And we're going to do this 
from the app component. So I will inject the type and I will start with lazy. So this is it. Let's go to the browser and we can see here that we have the red one. What about now if I switch this one to lazy one? We have the green one. So this is how we can use a condition to load, uh, to load different components. But first, let's see how things work. Angular, uh, so we all know that everything in Angular is like a class. And in order to differentiate each class, one from each other, we have this decorator, like this, at component. So by this one, we know that this class is like a component. And during the compilation, Angular is going to compile this component and will produce the code as we can see here. What we see here is that we have the class name, one component, which is this one. And we also have a factory, which is a component factory. And we have this CMP, which means that this is a component. We have the type, which is very important. And we will use this type later on. And as you can see, the type is also the name of the class. And we have the selector. So this is how a compiled component looks like. And of course, it has many, many, many other things. But in order to save some, uh, some space, I added there only the, uh, the absolute minimum. And as many components we have, Angular is going to compile all the components. For the sake of this presentation, let's keep in mind that Angular's architecture has a compiled component stack. Of course, I don't imply that this is how the architecture of Angular works, uh, but that's for, just for the sake of this uh, presentation. So we have a compiled component stack. We'll keep in mind and we'll use it later on. And if you're wondering how a component looks like, how a component from the lazy or lazy one looks like in the developer tools, so this is uh, the developer tools and we can see the source. And we'll have the factory and we'll have the factory here. And also we'll have the CMP. And as you can see here, we'll have the lazy one content component, which is very, very important. And somewhere here, we have also the selector. Now, in this infographic, I will try to guide you through the, all the flow of how we, we will go from the template to the, to, to the browser. Imagine that we have this very simple template with a div selector and a component selector. The component selector is just up one CMP. Angular, during the compilation, is going to have like an AST is going to have a lexical analysis is, and in any case is going to generate some tokens. During the token generator of this particular component, of this particular template, we're going to have two different nodes. The first one is the selector and the other one is going to be just an HTML div. And now we have, we have to have in mind that if I want to display something, Angular will try to pick and see, is this one a component, yeah, this is a component. And then we'll, Angular will try to pick the component from the compiled component stack that we see previously. And this is what we're going to get. And as you can see, we have the selector. So based on this, we can get the compiled component stack and voila, we have the component in our browser. This is awesome, this works very nice, but we have a problem here. How about if we're going to load many components? Imagine that we want to, to, to load 10 different components. According to the open close principle, uh, which says that it's open for extension, the code, it should be open for extensions, but closed for modifications, this is a violation. And this is a violation because we have to have 10 different conditions. If components is one or two or three or four and so on and so forth. So this is not something that we really like. And the solution to this problem is to lazy load the components. To lazy load the components, you are going to use a view container ref to dynamically create the components. And actually, the view container ref it's a container where we can dynamically attach views in other components. So this is what we're going to use. And now we jump on this in the second chapter, let's say, of this talk. And I'm we will try to present you how to load the component dynamically using a factory resolver. We're going, we will use the same template as we can see here, the exact same template, 
and has the same HTML with only one difference, that we have an ng container using a template reference variable, which is the lazy content. No more than this. So, firstly, let's see how do things work. Now, do you remember previously that we, that we talked about a compiled component stack? So, let's say that this is the compiled component stack. It's not that beautiful as an icon. I couldn't find a better one for the compiled component stack. But let's say that this one is the compiled components, right? Then, what we have to do to dynamically create a component is to resolve by type. This is the first thing. And actually, when we say that resolve by type is that we are doing a query, sort of query, in this compiled component stack. When we resolve by type, the return type is a compiled component, and then we have just to invoke another method, and the name of this method is create component. And voila, we have the, comp the, the component in the browser. So we need two, two steps, actually, resolve and create. And if we can see the code that we're going to use, we need to have the view child, and we're going to query it with a template reference variable that we created previously, and this is the lazy content. And very important that we need here to have this object, which is read view container ref, because we need this as an output to be a view container ref. And apart from this, as I said previously, we need two different steps, resolve and create. So this is the first one, the first step that we are going to resolve and actually all the method name is resolve component factory. And we use the component factory resolver that we have already injected in the constructor. But the very important thing is that we need two steps, resolve. What are you going to resolve? And here we have to provide the class name. I want to resolve the lazy content component. And the second one is create a component. And the question here is, where are we going to create the component? As you can see, we have the lazy content container, which is the item, the container that we used previously, that we created from the template previously. So since, since this is a view container ref, we can create a component. So let me go back a bit. As we said, we have two different steps, resolve and create. And this is what we did, resolve and create. Nice. So let's have a look. So allow me to discard all of these changes. And I'm going to change a branch and I will go to dynamic. So dynamically create components. So firstly, let's see the code. I will start from this one and I will kill also the ng-serve and I will start a new one. The lazy wrapper component, what it has is that we inject the type, the component type that we're going to use, either lazy or lazy one. And based on this one, we will resolve the component for a, part a particular component. We define there the class name. And if the component is lazy one, again, we define here a lazy one and different actual class name. As soon as we have this, as soon as we have this, we have to create the component. Something very important since we use here the component factory resolver in the app module we definitely need to declare the components and we definitely need to use the entry components so some of you might be like whoa don't we use ivy what do you want to have why do you need to create here the entry components there is a reason and the reason that is that we use the component factory resolver but later on we will see how to improve this so this is very important we need to declare and we need to use the entry components by declaring the components means that we'll have eager load components. So let's see how the code looks like. If I click the, this button, load the first, we will see that this is the first template. And if we click the second one, we can see the green. So load the first and load the second. And this is how, how it use, how it works. And actually, if we see the code, it's exactly the same in terms of condition, it's exactly the same with uh, the condition that we used previously in the previous solution. Uh, but this time we shift actually the responsibility. Instead of having the condition in the template, now we have the condition in the component. So let's go back in the slides. 
and I lied to you because previously what I said is that we're going to see uh, how to lazy load a component. But we didn't see how to lazy load a component, but we saw how to eager load a component, how to dynamically create a component. But bear with me, we will see it in a while. The recipe to lazy load a component is again to use a view container ref to dynamically create the component and also to use ES6 imports. So this is what we're going to use. And this is the third uh, option, they'll say, the third branch of this talk, how to lazy load a component. And the template is exactly the same. No changes here. We have the container with a template reference variable, which is the lazy content. Firstly, let's see how things work. If you remember, we discussed about compiled components, which was a stack, but this time, in order to use uh, the lazy load components, we, we, we utilize actually the webpack, and the webpack generates different chunks for us. If we have two different components, we will have two different chunks. One and the other one is here. So as soon as we have the chunks, then in our code, in our side as developers, what we have to do is to import using ES6 import, which in Agile, actually it downloads the component and we'll have to define a specific path. We will see later on how to use this. When we import the component, when we download the component, what we get is a compiled component. And this is very, very important to keep in mind that the component should be compiled, have to be compiled. And having the compiled component, then we'll have to resolve by type, and we'll get this one, the compiled component. And the second step is to create the component. If you remember previously, we said that we resolve and we create. And this is the exact same thing that, thing that we're going to do now, resolve and create, and voila, we we'll have the component in our browser. And things work similarly, and with the only difference that the compiled component stack is available in our browser as soon as we ask for it. So I ask for the second component and I have it. I ask for the third component and I have it in my browser. So they are com they are compiled, but I do not have it uh, preloaded in my browser. I have to ask for them. And now let's see the code. The code, apart from create the, resolve the component and create the component, first we have to have the import with await, ES6 import, and we have to define here the relative path. And this is the lazy content slash lazy content component. This is the path that the component leaves. The response of this one is an object. So this one is an object, lazy content component. And inside this object, we have the class name. So if you remember previously, we said that in order to resolve a component, we have to provide in the resolve component factory, the class name. And how can, can we get this? from the returned object. And dot lazy content component is a class name. And this is what we have. And this, uh, the other step is, of course, to create the component. And again, the question is, where are we going to create the component? Of course, in the container that we created previously. Let's have a look. So let me uh, change branch again. And I will go to lazy load components and yeah, this one, a lazy load components. Allow me to clear this one, the ng serve, and start a new serve. And as soon as we wait, let's see something very important. In the app module, we do not have them in the declarations, we do not have the components, which means that we, we will lazy load the components, and also we do not have ng components. Yeah, no ng components which is much, much better. So less configuration, we love less, of course, we love having less configuration. And let's see the code. The code here is we are in the lazy wrapper component. Nothing changed in the lazy content, nothing changed in the lazy one content. They are still very, very simple. Uh, sorry for this. Let's ignore all of this code. We don't need them. It was part of an experimentation and I forgot to remove them. So. If we, if we focus on the lazy wrapper component, something I missed here. Uh, yeah. Okay, I will revert back my changes. And I won't do it again in the live code. Uh, so uh, let's focus on the lazy wrapper component. 
what we have. Again, we have the component type, okay? And since we have the component type, again, we have the same condition. If the component type is lazy, I wait an import, I want to load this one, I want to load this component, and I have to provide the exact same path, the exact path, the relative path. As soon as I have this, then I have to resolve the component using here the class name. And in the second case, in the lazy one, I'm doing the exact same thing. I go to import, resolve the component, and provide here the class name. Something very important. Let me open this one. So Angular, what it does is that as soon as it sees that we have a weight import, it's like, hmm, I know what you're trying to do. You're going to have lazy load component, and you have here the path. Let me see. Do I have this path? Yeah, I have this path, and this is the component that you're going to compile. So you know what? I'm going to compile this component for you. So as soon as Angular sees that we have a path there, it compiles the component for us, and with uh, the support of, of Webpack, creates also this compiled component in different chunk. And now let's see how this works. Let me open also here the developer tools. And the first one is to click this button, load the first. And as you can see, here we have the lazy content, lazy content component. And if I click this, we can see that we have the compiled component. And also what we have here is the template. And if I click the second one, load the second, we, we can see the green lazy one load component. And here we can see also that we just downloaded the component. Nice. And if I continue doing this, uh, we don't uh, have to re-download the components because they have already been downloaded and cast. So, nice. But you know what? Let's, let's stay here a bit and let's see the following. Here we have lazy and here we have a lazy. It seems that we have a pattern. So we have lazy and lazy one and lazy here and lazy one here. And the same goes here. Yeah, it seems that we have a pattern. So let's go back in the presentation. And you know what? We have the exact same problem with open close principle violation. We managed to load the components using ES6 import. How to lazy load the components, but we still have the exact same problem. What about if I want to download, if I have to, uh, to have a condition for 10 different components? I have to have something like if the component type is equals lazy or lazy one or lazy two or lazy three and so on and so forth. The solution to this problem is to lazy load the components using a pattern. So let's have a look on this one. That's why I presented to you previously that we have here a pattern. And let's change the branch. And the branch is going to be, again, lazy components with pattern. I will clean this one and I will rerun it. Let's see the code. Actually, the code here, what it does is that it uses ES6 import and it's auto generate the path that we're going to use. Based on the component type, it just auto generate the path. But the problem here is the following, that Angular, as soon as it sees that we have here a weight import, it knows that we need to have uh, a compiled component to lazy load the component. And the question to, uh, that Angular does is, where is the component? I don't, I don't see here uh, anywhere any path, so I cannot resolve it. How can I compile it? And that's why here we have some warnings. And the warnings are, uh, so let me see, somewhere here says that is missing from TypeScript compilation. Please make sure it is in your TS config file via the files or include property. And as you can see the, uh, in the browser, let me close this. If I click the load the first, actually Angular tried to download something, but it failed. Module build failed, and it seems that we need to help this process, and we're going to help this process by compile the components by ourselves. How? We will go to the TS config. So let me open the TS config up. And here in the include, we will have the path of the component. The first one, copy relative path, and we'll have it here. And sorry, and we will do the exact same thing for the other one. So copy relative path and have it here. Let me kill this one, rerun it. And what we expect to, to see here is to have two different chunks and not to have the warnings. Cross your fingers, not to have the warnings. 
let's see give it some time nice and uh, as we can see we have two different chunks this is the first one and this is the second one no warnings which means that it should work so load the first nice so what we can see here is the lazy load the component and load the second we can load the second one and if we can see here what we have is different names we have zero and one uh, but this is okay and here is the compiled component and this is actually how to load lazy load the component and the question is again the same did we manage to, to resolve the open close principle violation no and the reason is that uh, again we have a shift of responsibility let's say uh, if we want to have 10 different components we need here in the include to have 10 different paths so we will improve this by using this one and the same here so let's give it a try let's wait a bit and if we make it we will see again two different chunks without any warnings and if something goes wrong, I will say that due to electricity, I couldn't solve the problems. Okay, nice. So we can see that we have two different uh, chunks. And if we can go to the browser, clear this one and load the first and load the second. Nice. So this means that if I copy this one, lazy one, so let's give it a try. And I will name it like lazy two. lazy to content and I will also name this one lazy to content component and of course I will name the selector and the class name so this means that let me kill this one and rerun it once more but if I go now in the app component HTML without touching anything else let me also have here just a margin right in this one and I'm going to component to load this lazy2. And I will have here Angular. Yeah, give it a try once more. Angular Athens. Okay, so what do we have here? Let's see, we have three different chunks, 0, 1, and 2. And if we can see, and you know what? Let me also change the color here. And I will have it like, I don't know, purple. Let's give this try. And this is going to be lazy to load component. Nice. So clear everything. Load the first. We can see that this is lazy load component. Load the second, lazy one load component. And Angular Athens. Nice. We'll have the lazy two load component with purple. This is super cool. And that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. At least from my end, I enjoyed it. Uh, regardless of all of these uh, weird things with no electricity and torch in my room, uh, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fanis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fanis, for uh, the interesting talk. It, uh, at times, it felt like uh, writing the source code of, of Angular itself. Uh, <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. Um, so the floor is also open for questions now. If you don't mind, I'll ask a couple myself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so what would be um, like real world applications of this? Where could we use it? Uh, very good question. So uh, how we can use it? Imagine a very simple case is that we need, for example, to have a wizard. And in the wizard, to have a stepper, like step one, step two, step three, or to have yeah something, something like this. And sometimes in the wizard, we might have different components. So in this, in this scenario, we, we, we can just lazy load the components. Or in our side, at least in our application, we had, uh, let's say a popover component like uh yeah something like a popover component and this component could have different injected components and we didn't know what kind of component this could be uh and we have to just just to provide a different type and based on the type to get the component and present it so this is something that i i have in my application that i can do work for for this product 
But apart from this, uh, something that I have in mind is the wizard that would, could be really helpful. I hope this answers your question. Great, thanks. And uh, maybe even this is a, like a sneak peek to a future without modules that Angular yes. is preparing us for. Uh, another question I have is that, uh, uh, do you have any examples maybe or ideas on how to reduce the boilerplate on this? Can you, maybe an idea would be to put everything in a library or? How to reduce a boilerplate, what do you mean? Uh, inside the, um, the component that, that handled the logs loading, there was uh, quite some boilerplate there. Uh, ah, yeah, I can, I can show you. So I can share my screen, very good one. So I can share my screen. And let's see, where do I have all my things? So. Yeah, here. So as you said, there is there is some boilerplate. And how can we reduce this one? So we have here, we have the component. Where is the component? Yeah, so here we have the component class name. And how can we make things work better? How about if I don't use at all the component factor resolver? And as you said, to minimize the boilerplate. So what am I going to do is have it like this and the component class name, I will have it like this dot component to load. And I will just declare the property. And this is going to be just the type of any. So having this one, then we can uh, use this, exactly this one, and replace this container. Or you know what? I will just remove this one and use the ng component outlet, just a directive. And here I will just load the component to load. And let me kill this one and rerun it once more. So what I did is that I no longer use the component factor resolver. I have just the returned component and actually I have the class name and I use the class name using the component uh, outlet. And let's hope that this will work. Load the first, yeah. Load the first, load the second, and Angular Athens. And this is at least what I have in mind to reduce the boilerplate. Nice, very nice. Uh, another question from from Mark uh, uh, is that um, how does this approach uh, with lazy component works if these components have further de dependencies themselves into other components? And um, he then continues saying um, there is no for example, there is no module to declare other components. Yeah, also this is a very good one. So I will share again my screen. I will keep my screen also. Uh, so let's go here. And as Mark said, we need to have the components. So what, what I did is that I tried uh, what I tried in the past. So let me close everything and go here in the lazy content component. So the first thing that I tried was to have in the constructor for example, to have just a service and you work just fine. So either the- we, we are not seeing your screen. Uh, uh, okay, so I will stop maybe sharing. Katerina can uh, share, share a funny screen. So again, share screen, share screen. Yep, now we see. Okay, nice. So what I try to do is that here in, in the lazy content component, what I tried to do was to have to inject actually a service in the constructor. And it worked nice with the service. Either the service, uh, it has a provider using actually a provider from the component, or even if we have a singleton service. But things goes uh, way hard, harder actually, you will have another direct, another uh, dependency like uh, reactive forms. And thanks to Sander Elias, so we had this uh, in another talk, what we can do is the following. So imagine that here we have a form control and I will name that this form control is just a new form control. Sorry, give it a try. So let's, th let's think that we have this one and let's try to apply a binding. So I will remove this one and I will have input type equals text. And I will use the directive form control for control equals to the form control that I just created. 
And now we need somehow to inject the directive, to, uh, to, to inject the, both the directive and the module. And how we can do this? So let me copy this one, close, and I will have here the ng module. It seems that from uh, uh, at least from Angular side, this is not mature enough to uh, to use it. So what we can have is a reactive forms module. So let's give it a try. Reactive forms module, and I will name this like lazy, whatever module. And this is how sort of we 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 manage to have. Let me kill this one and rerun it. We managed to have a, an imported module and use it in the lazy component. But let's see if this will work. And also, I'm going to have just a simple interpolation here with a value just to make sure that everything works as expected. And it will go here and didn't work. So it seems that I missed something. Maybe, ah, yeah, I have to declare my component here, of course. Load this first. Yeah, and this is it. And now let's give it a try once more. Let's reload and see if the component is lazy loaded and we have it lazy loaded. It is lazy loaded, and at the same time, we have the imported module. And yeah, I know that this is not the best code that we can see. Uh, but it seems that at least from uh, uh, from the Angular side, Angular perspective, this is not that mature. And I hope this answers the question. Okay, very nice. Uh, another question uh, from Sergio is um, he asked to explain a bit the part when we do the includes with the asterisk in the last uh, last part of the presentation. The includes. Okay, so. Uh, Katerina, sorry, I will share again my screen. Sorry for this, back and forth. So the asterisk ask actually is like a wild character. It's like we say to the uh, to Angular, let me go here, that I want to lay to load anything from SRC up. So let's follow this, SRC up. And then I want to load lazy and something. So lazy and something is both dash content, both dash wrapper, both one slash content. And then we are like, from this, from the resolved directory, I want to load again something. And something is like uh, lazy dash is lazy and something. So lazy dash content component is matches with this wild character. And can you possibly explain like what Angular does under the hood with this include array? Uh, actually, uh, what it tries to do, uh, not to try, uh, actually is compiles the components. We have two different options to compile the components. Uh, maybe there are many, uh, but at least those I have in mind. So the first one is to, to use the ES6, like we saw previously, in the lazy wrapper with uh, this import and have the predefined path. When you have the predefined path, Angular will try to compile the component. Which component? The component that lives in this path. But we have to have it predefined. If we do not have it predefined, and the path is actually generated during the runtime, Angular doesn't know what to compile. And we have to help it. And we have the framework by defining ourselves that I want to include in, in the binding, uh, sorry, in the compilation, I want to include this one and is going to create different chunk for this particular component. Does it nice. the question? Yes, I, I think so. Very nice. Okay. Right. Um, I think we don't have any further questions. Um, and at this point, let's all thank uh, Fanis a lot for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And it seems that I have three minutes battery. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Just in time. All right. Just hope you get electricity back soon, uh, Fanny's. Uh, 
yeah. also the same for the rest of Athens, of course. And um, and to wrap up things, uh, we are very uh, pleased uh, as the Angular Athens uh, uh, team to also introduce a new member uh, uh, in the core team, and this is uh, Theoclitos. So I uh, just uh, everyone we can say a big uh, welcome uh, for, uh, to Theoclitos uh, to our uh, core team of Angular Athens. <laughs> welcome Theoclitos. Welcome Theoclitos. And uh, yeah, I think that was it for today's meetup. Uh, thank you all for being here. And and have a very, very nice evening.